First up is going to be Janet Kuypers. She's originally from Chicago, but then she found Austin and she found Tom Will, the poet, and she started doing her thing with all of the place around Austin. And, and uh, I said, you know, you really need to bring that act out to Drip and Springs. So that's what she agreed to do tonight. And uh, she wants to combine music and whatnot. She's got musical back up there with her husband, John. Welcome, Janet. He's got to start this all up. <laughs> Hi, thank you. My name is Janet. I'm originally from Chicago. I'll try to break something for you. I hope you enjoy it. Sometimes it seems the more I ask for, the less I receive. The only true freedom is freedom from the heart's desires. And the only true happiness this way alive. I'm here to show you a whole new millennium. I'm here to tell you that we're starting anew. So, fasten your seatbelts, hang on to your pants, place your seat trays in their upright and locked position, for it's a bumpy ride, and I'm here to tell you why. Well, you need a leader, and I'm stepping up to the plate. You keep asking for a big brother, and I'm here to set you straight. You want someone to wipe your noses for you? Well, pick up the tissue and do it yourself. Because when you give up your rights, you take away mine, and we're not having any of that. <laughs> I'm here to usher in a whole new millennium. I'm here to usher in a whole new generation. They say that Eve ate from the tree of knowledge, but you know, she shouldn't have stopped just then, because the loggers are raping the trees of knowledge. The loggers are raping the force of talent, the force of ability, the force of reason, of skill, of logic, perseverance, and life. We're letting them rape the force of excellence. And you know it's now time to take it all back, because I'm here to share the whole new millennium, and I'm here to show you how it's going to be done. You're looking for peace in all the wrong places. You're asking your leaders to save you from yourselves. But your leaders are losers, and they're worse off than you. It's time to make choices, and it's time to lay claim to everything that we've been blindly giving away, because I'm here to usher in a, in a whole new millennium. Take charge of yourself, and I'll take charge of me. I'm my leader, not yours. So wipe your own noses. Take it in your own hands, people. Mold your own tools. This is the new millennium, and this is your chance. And nobody should be showing us how to fail. People mastered that feat a millennia ago. So set your own rules and do something fast, because it's time to take charge, and it's time to be alive. I'm here to tell you that there's a new sensation. And I'm here to tell you that there's a new salvation. And the only true happiness in this way lies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, I wasn't going to make him play guitar for the whole time, so I thought I would. I would. Uh, have something set here that would have music from a friend of mine, um, the Haman of South Africa, Francois LaRue. He's a little far away, he's around the hemisphere, he can't make it, so he's giving me music to play for you. You're hearing music of his called Big Drops Falling on My Walk. And toward the end of the show, it is going to meld into something called the cold feeling of touch. Um, but here are a bunch of poems for you. Um, yes, you see my t-shirt. I went to see the solar eclipse and that's why I'm wearing it. And 12 hours later at 1.30 in the morning, I couldn't sleep, so I decided to write this. And it is called, Knew I Had to Be Ready. And I also apologize, I actually have solar sunglasses. 
but I didn't bring them, so I'm gonna use these just as a prop for it. So this is called New I Had to Be Ready. Got a pair of those solar sunglasses the other day. I, I challenged myself to stare at the sun, and really, what a ridiculous concept to begin with. But wearing these glasses made me blind as a bat until I walked outside and guessed where to look. And then I found it, and I was awestruck. And even though I didn't create these glasses, even though I didn't create this scientific tool, I suddenly thought that I could challenge the science gods. Yeah, try to test me again. I dare you. For the past 18 hours, we drove six plus hours each direction to get to the focal point for the longest duration of the total eclipse of the sun. I had my camera, I even had my solar sunglasses, so I was ready for what I thought would be a half hour show. And I may have been mistaken. It may have taken three times as long to watch the moon move its way in the opposite direction over how our sun dances along our daytime sky. So every few seconds I'd take a picture and then slide on those solar sunglasses so that I could try to actually see that crescent moon with my own two eyes. Ugh, clouds moved in for a bit. I was in a panic. Oh no, those evil weather gods can't make me miss my chance. But as the clouds parted, the light cloud mist danced in front of my sun and moon, adding wisps to their show. But I knew I had to be ready. It started getting darker, the wind picked up, and I knew that when my moon and sun were at their actual total solar eclipse, it would last for like less than two minutes. So I had to remove the filter, change the aperture and f-stop, and then just try to point and click. And I think I did a pretty good job, yeah. but all I could think, <laughs> but all I could think was I saw this white ring and the sun solar flares, each trying to take their way around from that moon and trying to block it from seeing one of its children. All I could think when I saw this ring of fire and destruction, it was just so crisp and vivid, and it reminded me of the intricacies of the human eye with the iris colors dancing in a circle like molecular fireworks or like petals of a flower in full bloom. Taken aback, I was awestruck, and it was also breathtaking until I realized that there are as many atoms in the human eye as all constellations in the known universe. So, if seeing my son's corona made me see the cornea with its intricate iris, it made me wonder. They say the eye is the window to the soul. So, is my seeing my son at its most naked moment? Is my son somehow trying to share with me its secrets too? I've been trying to figure out my son's message and I'll keep trying to take science on, always daring it to finally, fully reveal itself to me. Thank you, thank you. Um, this next piece is actually in a book that I just recently released since I was going back to Chicago. I put poems of mine into two poetry books. Um, if you can be attracted to somebody's pheromones, maybe you're attracted to their memes. John came up with the word pharaoh memes. And so all the shows that I've done here are going into this collection book. And this next poem is one poem that is from this book. And it's like, Oh, I'm done. Uh, and this is called Original Snowbirds. I would like to tell you the story about a bird. I think it's fair to say that this is one of the original snowbirds. In Hawaii, the kolea is a Pacific golden plover with foraging, and they're foraging birds, and they hang out in Hawaii until the spring, when they've fattened up for their over 2,000 mile non-stop flight to Alaska. Yeah, they have no waterproofing for their feathers, so they don't actually rest, but they fly 
for three days straight. And fossils found in Oahu even reveal the clovers have done this for 120,000 years. Because in the spring, they fly up north, and these birds spend three months in Alaska. They reclaim the, uh, last year's breeding grounds, and they incubate eggs hatching in 25 days. Mama and daddy bird then leave the nest just after the last chick hatches. And predators like foxes, jaegers, and caribou force the chicks to leave the nest. And in barely a month, these chicks can then fly come August, which is when the parents then leave. Now, these adult plovers eat like mad. They gain 50% of their body fat so that they have fuel for their three-day flight over 2,000 miles to their Hawaiian home. Yeah, you heard me right. Every spring, these Pacific Golden Plovers, after bulking up, make a three-day non-stop flight up north and lose 50% of their body mass doing it. And right after their babies are ready to fly, and they bolt up again once more, they leave their babies to fend for themselves. Because, you know, the little ones can't make the flight. They don't have the bulk to make the trip, and they've never even learned how to navigate. I mean, with Alaska summers, they'll never see stars or a night sky at all until they fly south. Maybe baby plovers use Earth's magnetic field, because it's a miracle when they do reach Hawaii. <laughs> but I've been told that when they return, they arrive in Hawaii at the exact same spot, year after year, for up to 20 years, and annually are welcomed by the natives. We think we understand the seasons, but in Hawaii, they mark the seasons by the coming and going of the kalea. That's the Hawaiian word that mimics the sounds of the Pacific Golden Plovers, the parents and their babies, because they mark the passage of time. enough, those are not Pacific Golden Plover noses, those are words that I've heard around here. <laughs> so for you, <laughs> there's not accurate to the bird sounds, but I'll do what I can. And she said, autumn, autumn, autumn. So I'm like, all right, here we go. I'll come up with some autumn. Autumn, the sight of vibrant colored leaves, a sunburst of coral reds and rich ambers. Autumn, the smell of burning leaves, a thin line of smoke rising from a pile of ashes. Autumn, the taste of fall harvests and all the fixings cooked for a small, happy, thankful family. Autumn, touch a leaf falling from a treetop, guided by a cool autumn breeze. Autumn, look around, it's here. All you have to do is enjoy it. When I fell in love for real, he then said to me, I want to marry you. I want to marry you in autumn when the leaves are changing, when the weather is perfect. I felt the enchanting, changing season. This is now our transformation. As he said to me, I want to marry you in autumn. Never before in my life have I needed to water a tree. But here I am, bringing buckets of water out every couple of days for my mighty oak. So it will be a healthy tree filled with colorful leaves for the changing seasons. Granted, my mighty oak is three feet tall. <laughs> it was the only tree on the property that we bought, but okay, I'll water it. <laughs> and maybe when no one else's tree leaves transform through vibrant colors for a month before autumn turns to winter in this 
semi-arid town. Maybe then I can smile at my three foot tall mighty oak, the only tree I've got, as I reach down and touch the golden and sepia leaves at the top of my tree. <laughs> We work indoors so we can avoid the heat. All summer long our fans stay on as we try to find relief. We want a natural wind, one not filled with the beating sun reminding us of our tortured days. And then it comes. We step outside and we wait for the cool now cool breeze. And the heat's now quelled. There's color in leaves, and we finally now can breathe. We lived through the heat. We've seen the green that's not bright enough when droughts quell the vibrancy of trees. So enjoy this time. Look at the leaves, golden, amber, auburn, burnt sienna, taupe. <laughs> These are the times when sandy and smoky are as beautiful as rosy in the world we see. All summer long, we work indoors so we can avoid the heat. But let's flip the switch and change the seasons and be glad when the breeze can't be beat. This very short piece is um, an old poem of mine called Seasons. I wrote it um, while recovering in the hospital. I stopped in an intersection and a couple cars hit me and I had to relearn how to walk and talk and eat. And, and, and uh, this is just one thing that's in it. It's in a book about that and it was also in my poetry collection book of 25 years called Ouvre and I'm just showing off the cover. Ouvre. <laughs> Ouvre. Um, and there are bits of other older poems of mine in that as well. Um, but this is called Seasons, 1998. The entity of Earth lives attacked by its denizens. Spring follows winter. Winter fire burns bright. Warmth flows over my brick hearth. Summer fire is shunned. Grandchildren bring joy, vigor, love, fun, liveliness. With age comes calm, peace, knowledge. Soft, loose, wrinkled skin. White, coarse, bristly chin whiskers mark the wise woman. Limbs etched into sky. Full white clouds gather in close. Foretell winter snow. Um, this is the last piece I'm going to do for you. I was doing things about a bunch of seasons, and this one mentions autumn. <laughs> um, I want to thank you very much, and uh, this is called uh, Death Takes Many Forms. It is winter now. The trees have lost their leaves. The, the city is covered in a thin layer of soot and snow. The grass is dead. In the sunless sky, blackbirds circle overhead, searching for prey. An eerie cold settles over everything. Nothing is growing anymore. Death takes many forms. And for you, death first came when you were five years old, and your mother had to give you three shots of insulin a day until you could take a needle to yourself. Did it hurt to push that needle into your arm the first time? Or, or did it hurt you more to know you had no choice? Death takes many forms. Death can be someone telling you without trying that they're losing their eyesight. Behind Coke bottle glasses, you would see me and say, that's a nice black suit you're wearing. 
and I would tell you, it's green, and you wouldn't believe me. You wouldn't hear the howling wind of the changing seasons. Death takes many forms. I, I know what follows the autumn wind. It is winter now. Do you remember when it happened? The temperatures are settled. The temperature drops first only slightly. It's almost imperceptible. It's only when the first snow falls do you realize where all the seasons have gone. Death takes many forms. Death can be a sweat-soaked shirt, the shakes, dizziness when you needed food. You would look as pale as a ghost as I would hold your cold, wet arm and study you. Quick, some sugar will make everything better. Isn't everything better yet? Death takes many forms. The signs of death can come when you lose your circulation. My feet are numb, Janet, you'd say. I can't feel my feet anymore. And I would rub your feet for you, and you would say, it makes a difference that you feel better. If only I could do this forever. Death takes many forms. I said goodbye to you to travel my own road, but I didn't think it was the last goodbye. How was I to know? When I left, I knew you didn't want me to go. And now it's my turn. Why are we always saying goodbye to each other? Are you trying to teach me a lesson? Because if you are, well, I've learned it. Trust me, I have. You can come back now. Death takes many forms, and now, now it seems you take me down there with you, and now it seems you take me down into that casket with you, and I'm, and I'm running my hand along your jacket lapel, and I can feel the coldness of winter all around me, and I can hear them shoveling the dirt over my head, and I want to get out, and I want to take you with me. Death takes many forms. Death can be that hole you left. You know, right over here, just a little to the left. I, I keep wondering when the pain will go away, when everything will be better. Uh, but, but, you, but you once showed me that winters could be beautiful instead of that darkened dirty snow lacing the city streets, you showed me a, a quieting snowfall over a lake at your parents' backyard, glistening in an untouched whiteness. I told you I hated winters, and you told me, this you don't hate. Well, I'm still learning. It is winter now. And death takes many forms. The seasons change for you and I. It is snowing, and something is ending. It is snowing. Somewhere. It is snowing.